Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. You know, there's an old saying, if you want things to stay the way they are, they'll have to change. So Guinness's view was, well, we want to be a profitable company. We want to help society, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, they just adapted to the times. But there's some key principles there in accounting which probably have never changed. Very true words from his experience in the business world and academia from today's guest mentor, Martin Quinn. And Martin also helps us deconstruct on today's episode how having practical knowledge from his practical years in business has really helped his students at Queen's University, how some of the innovations driven by the accounting team that he uncovered when going through the Guinness archives has played a key part in ensuring that that business, that well-known world brand named business, has always made a profit since it first listed in the late 1800s, and very importantly, how to build respect and trust amongst colleagues at work. Now, before we go into the show, I just want to say really enjoyed my conversations with Martin. He's got a great way of telling stories. It's very engaging. And some of the insights that he's picked up in his career and particularly going through the Guinness archives are really sort of really cool, really interesting. And I know you'll love them. And Martin also has a blog and has written in some magazines. I'll put the links in the show notes which you can find at sitnshow.com. And again, we really appreciate when you recommend the show to colleagues and also subscribe and rate the podcast at all the major sites, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Spotify. I know you're going to enjoy this one. I definitely enjoyed my time with Martin. So without further ado, over to Martin and the show. So Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. Hey, Mark, I'm delighted to get another chance to have a have a conversation together. I think there's so many topics we could talk about. We'll do our best to to keep it uh, brief for our audience. But before we jump into it, would you perhaps mind maybe taking our audience on a brief journey through your uh, career in accounting and finance? Thanks, Andrew, for having me on. Back in, God, when was it? 93, I started to work as a, a, an accountant in a small chartered practice just to get some experience during the summer. Learned how to prepare a set of accounts that summer manually, debits and credits and ledgers and paper. Back the next summer with them while I was still at college, ended up getting a job there for a couple of years. Had my SEMA qualification, but working in practice, but really wanted to get into industry. 96, 97, started to work as a management accountant and clothing manufacturer. Then I moved on to a multinational, a paper company. In 2004, I made a jump to academia, uh, mainly for, for personal and family reasons and that's what I've been doing since. I'm a SEMA member obviously and um, still keep my fingers in doing some real accounting from time to time. We can get into more detail. Yeah, 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 definitely. And, and uh, there's a few things actually I'd love to um, to talk about some of that work that you're doing as well. But, uh, in terms of in terms of that cheap jump to academia, how did you push that? I mean, what, what was that like? We've had a couple of guests on the show so far that have done it, but for you like what, what was that like, jumping from real accounting to academic? As I said, the reason for it was, was, was a, a more of a personal reason. And basically, simply, I was working in a multinational and doing a lot of travel and our family was starting. So I didn't want to be away too much. As I would have been typically away Monday to Friday, I was working on a implementation team, implementing SAP around the operations in Europe. It was, I have no idea what's going on here type approach initially. <laughs> And then somebody told me, you have to do a PhD, and you're there, what's that? <laughs> you know, you do these things, you do what you're told, you get a PhD, and, and um, you know, you figure your way around. And I suppose initially teaching, my, I can recall my first class, it was to an MBA class. Am I allowed to say I was bricking it? Well, I've just said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just said it. I've just said it. You know, then at some point in the class, I realized, you know, I've just worked with people like this. What am I afraid yeah. of? And some of them... There was one person who would have been a well-qualified accountant who works as a, an internal auditor, I think, in one of a, a large public company. But the rest of them knew nothing about accounting because they weren't accounting specialists. Mm-hmm. You know, once you get over that realization of, 
actually, I can teach these people something. It was okay. Then as you develop your teaching skills over the years, you realize, God, I've got a lot of practical experience. I'll give you one example, maybe, you know, you're teaching the basics of standard costing and you, you know, you say people, you know, in the textbook, it says, here's, you know, things you could use like time and motion studies and so on about doing, <laughs> setting up standards. But yeah. uh, I, I recounted the story of, of a, 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 you know, an upgraded part to one of the machines which makes cardboard in the paper factory. And, and I said, you know, how do you think I set the standards for the speed of that, guys? Uh, and I described the machine to them, how it makes paper and so on, and the cost of a 10 million euro issue, if memory serves me correct. And they, you know, you know, obviously maybe 19, 20 year olds are looking at you like you've got 10 heads. And But you, you try to get them to think and then say, you ask the manufacturer of the machine how fast it can go. You put that in as your initial standard. And, and then in week one, you find out that that's not how it actually works in the real world. <laughs> um, you find that <laughs> trade unions and traditions and whatever say, no, we can't run the machine that fast. So you actually go and talk and communicate with people in, in the factory, in your operation to find out how fast things can go or how things should be done. And when you can relate those experiences. And another example I've used quite often in class and still use, and it always comes back to me in the exam papers. When you're teaching about uh, byproducts, you know, the uh, byproducts mm -hmm. of a process, and the example I always give is chewing gum because chewing gum is a byproduct of, of the manufacture of paper, um, virgin paper, paper that's made from the first time from, from wood pulp. And for some reason, people, students of 19, 20, 21 years of age always remember that. <laughs> uh, so you always get a good example of a byproduct is chewing gum. <laughs> um, but, you know, I know we're having a laugh here, but like, the reality of it is, if I didn't have those experiences, I can't convey those examples. Another example was the importance of a petty cash book, oh, which sounds mm -hmm. highly unimportant, uh, but uh, I can recall an example, <laughs> not in my own company, where if proof of postage was available in the petty cash book, and you know it could have been just a receipt for a stamp, a government authority would have allowed a claim to be processed. The claim was beyond its deadline, and like we were talking, you know, I think it was forty thousand euro. You know, so the tiniest little control could have saved the company 40 grand. Practical experience to me is wonderful, a wonderful asset to have when, when you want to teach. Yeah, well, well, look, I mean, it, there's a number of things in there, Martin. Like it, it helps, it definitely helps bring some some black and white stuff on a page or mm -hmm. numbers to mm -hmm. life. I mean, the way the way you just relayed, relayed some of those uh, examples, I mean, is that... Is that a bit of a challenge with, and I don't know if people are being critical as well of, of, of academia, it's just very much black and white, theoretical, mm -hmm. it's not really applied to, to the real world, so how useful is mm -hmm. it? I mean, do you think that's a fair challenge or do you think that the academics must have some sort of practical experience to be useful? I mean, I, I don't want to be too critical of people that mm -hmm. I don't know an awful mm -hmm. lot about, but you've been mm -hmm. in that world, you've been in, in, in industry, commerce, yeah, 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 practice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, like... Oh, what do you think? Is it? Is it? Is it? Um, do you need that practical experience? Personal opinion, yes. I think practical experience is invaluable. I wouldn't detract though from, let's say, an academic who's never had practical experience because maybe they can see things in a different way. But uh, I have had several examples in the past where I can say, well, that's not actually how it happens in the real world. To be fair, you do need to know how to do things at least in theory, before you can even apply the knowledge to practice. That's a, that's a great way of looking at it, isn't it? You need to have some sort of hypothesis at least, right? I know it's interesting to use the expression, you're bricking it. I want to bring that up again. I find that a little odd because in our real world, mm -hmm. you know, we're very much used to educating the business mm -hmm. on what's going on. Uh, we're curious. Yeah. I, I found a lot of accountants uh, generally quite a curious yeah. bunch who uh, want to find out and get to the bottom mm -hmm. of the matter. I mean, do you think we've got some some good skills to 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 you know for those who want to jump into to maybe teaching or academia or even other sort of more skills we need to develop to to bridge the gap? Oh uh, yeah, like I kind of have a strange view on that. Well, maybe it's not strange. I think there are certain skill sets which maybe skill sets is not the correct word, but certain walks of life which have over recent years or recent decades perhaps become more about a profession than being a vocation. 
And I can think of teaching. Teaching okay. and nursing are two that come to mind. To be a professional nurse or even a doctor can do academically well, but you haven't got the social skills to deal with a patient. I think teaching is a bit like that. Teaching is a vocation or was a vocation. It was seen as a vocation. There are people who, and I can't say, it's a bit like leadership. I think there are people who are just naturally good leaders. They get educated and they become better leaders. And I think there are other mm -hmm. people who will never lead anything. And I think teaching are, teaching is possibly a bit like that. There are people who have knowledge and can be reasonable teachers. But then there are teachers, and we can probably all remember somebody who inspired us in primary school, in secondary school, or in yeah, university. Yeah. And they are the, you know, the teachers that just have some natural innate talent. I'm not saying I have it, I don't know. But you can teach a teacher, you can train a teacher. <laughs> and, and like accountants by nature, we should be good communicators. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I'm sure we've all had experiences of accountants who are not good communicators. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, I, I think yeah, there's probably some of our listeners chuckling there, like, you know, in their experiences. But I would say, like, in, term, in terms of uh, communication and teaching, mm. you, you wrote a fantastic piece uh, in Financial Management magazine. I, I, that's where I saw it. Yeah. About Guinness. And there was so much we could learn from our history Mm -hmm. And the way you just told the story, there's, there's so much, there's so much in there. I find it difficult to pick out any one thing, but you know, in terms of our audience, Martin, like, was there any sort of favorite sort of thing that you found when you were maybe actually, maybe if you summarize what you did for us from yeah. an article perspective yeah. and maybe pinpoint any particular uh, area that you found most interesting or, or a particular favorite of yours? Yeah, sure. Like I first went into the Guinness Archive in 2011 following was a program called Who Do You Think You Are? The Family History Program. I'm one of these people who absolutely hated history in school. But as you get older, you start to appreciate history. You know, since 2011, I've done a lot of research and writing based on Guinness. And seeing as seem as 100 years old this year, 2019, um, I was asked would I do something on historical accounting at Guinness. Like in the article, I, I give some examples on, on mainly accounting change over the years. And, and the first piece of work there was was on, um, you know, the cooperage. Um, like today, kegs of beers, they are aluminium kegs. Back in the 1800s, they were wooden barrels. But, you know, the system that Guinness and Diageo still use to this day is the same as what it was used in the 1800s um, in terms of tracking the kegs. Because, like, I think the figure now in Diageo is about 100 and something million mm. pounds wow. worth of these returnables. So they have to be controlled. Mm. Uh, and, and the system set up was set up back in the 1800s. It's now embedded within an ERP system. Like that, that to me is... God, you know, we think we've moved on, but actually the system is actually quite old. And then I wrote, found out something about, you know, the First World War. To the people back then, it was something that they thought would have been over in six or seven weeks. Uh, but it lasted four years, as we know. Crazy. And Guinness were had additional costs because they were shipping um, beer from Dublin across the Irish Sea to, to places like Bristol and Edinburgh and Cardiff and Liverpool, Glasgow. And there was a thing called a German U-boat in the sea, in the Irish Sea, and they did lose a ship. Oh. So there was additional costs. And those additional costs were what we would call in today's and basically given out to the various cost centers. So, you know, they kind of had a responsibility accounting structure. And like that's over 100 years ago. Then, you know, later, a little bit later after the First World War, they, they introduced what were called uh, Smith Premier, I think, accounting machines. These were typewriters that could add. This was new technology at the time. It was like it an iPhone. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But like, today, you know, it was. It was yeah. like the iPhone arriving in 2008 or whatever. Right. They, cut, they cut down their close time because the, the machines added customer statements, for example. Every customer got a statement because right. there was more time available that could be done. Previously, they only done statements to bigger customers. And like today, you know, we, we think, you know, you have to get paid. You have to have cash in your business. Mm. Uh, and if we think back then, they didn't have the technology or the manpower to be able to, to issue statements on a regular basis. The problems that were faced introducing these technologies and the outcomes are pretty much the same as they would be today in terms of any new technology project. You know, jobs were lost. Efficiencies were gained. Uh, and that would be probably the case in, any, in anything today. The other thing that really interested me was um, the 1960s. Mm -hmm. A brewery was set up in Nigeria 
And as an Irish man, I could never figure out how can you drink a pint of stout <laughs> just West Africa at 30 degrees or whatever temperature it may be, humid, warm climate. And that project is still actually going on. But at the end of a file in the archive, we found an analysis done by the accounting department in Guinness. And, you know, the board had decided we're going to bottle in Nigeria, in Lagos. So in other words, we would brew it in Liverpool, I think it was, and we'll put it on a boat in a big vat or something and we'll bottle it locally. And in the 1960s, Nigeria was becoming independent, so it was probably going to slap an excise tax on imports mm -hmm. and beer would be one of them. So if they were bottling locally, they might somehow get around that. But the accountants got the numbers and said, no, guys, build a brewery. It was a bigger profit, quicker return on the investment, higher return on capital. And I think until very recently, that brewery in Lagos has been the biggest brewer of Guinness in the world. I think James's Gate has passed it now uh, with some, you know, reinstallation or renewing of plant in, the, in recent years. That's amazing. Other other little things I've seen in the archives over time where, where the Guinness archives where, where you just say, God, you know, we, we think we've advanced, but these guys were doing this these things 50, 60, 100 years ago. You know? Yeah, but but like, you know, do we do we need, I know it sounds a bit of a bad thing to, to say. Actually, just just for our audience, I mean, most Irish people know the, the, the you know, the foundation of Guinness or when it's set up. I mean, it's such a natural icon, been around since 1759. Uh, found the Arthur Guinness. It's like everyone in an Irish pub quiz would know that, uh, or even at school would probably know that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but it's been around a long time. Yeah. And do we really need to have changed stuff that works? You know, like maybe change how we do it, make it more efficient. But, but obviously what the accountants were doing at Guinness worked because it's mm -hmm. still around. It's an iconic brand. Yeah. And it, it must have been one of, the, one of uh, I don't know, I, I'm guessing a, a, an early multinational. I mean, it's pretty much in most countries around the world. I mean, the challenges they've dealt with and they're still still there, still strong. Yeah, they're still there and they're still strong. I, I think just, just an aside fact, uh, the financial statements of Guinness are available from 1886 when it went public. They have never, ever made a loss. That's amazing. Which is an achievement in, in itself. In, in, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an achievement. And I suppose another thing to bear in mind is that they were family business for much mm. of the time well, yeah. until about 1986. Family business, you, you can have a little bit more direct control, I guess. But yeah, to go back to your point, I suppose we could say, uh, I haven't looked obviously at every year of accounting in Guinness over 100 years or more, but like things changed uh, over time, certainly. But those things changed to keep stability, to keep the company profitable. So I haven't looked in detail, but like I know in the 1960s, they brought in more advanced budgeting systems, typical of what we would have today. And that was probably because they were one of the first organizations in Ireland to have a computer system, which could do these budgeting things in large organizations. But, you know, there's an old saying, if you want things to stay the way they are, they'll have to change. So mm -hmm. Guinness's view was, well, we want to be a profitable company. We want to help society, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, they just adapted to the times, but there's some key principles there in accounting which probably have never changed. That is some run rate, you know, like to, to ha have a profitable business every single year. And I love that expression as well. You know, like that, that's definitely the, the right, right mentality is forcing you to look to, to what we can do, what we do well, what we can do better. Um, I, you know, yeah, and like one of the things about that really struck me about the financial statements was in the early days, it was signed off by Torquand Young and Co. Auditors, which is obviously part of EY today. The financial statements were four pages long between 1886 and 1947, I think. Four pages. An introduction, you know, Arthur Guinness, Son and Company Limited, profit and loss account, balance sheet. At the bottom of the balance sheet, a three or four line audit report. And then a proxy form on the back <laughs> for the AGM. And, yeah. you know, now what have we got? Yeah, I, pages and maybe, <laughs> does, uh, yeah but does that 200 pages make a, a company any better? Like, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, <laughs> no, that's, 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 well, that's the point I'm thinking, you know, it's, you know, do we, re I know if I totally appreciate IFRSs and all this, but I'm just thinking, God, you know, is there no way to make it a little bit simpler? for the average joe well well exactly exactly actually i'm just thinking you know when you said four pages there i'm gonna have to make, mention that to katie my wife because uh that's that's how long her accounts are uh her, her statements are four pages long <laughs> as well <laughs> but uh you know 
let's be honest, at a management level. Yeah, exa- 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I completely <laughs> right. But, but I suppose, what, you know, this this complexity, do you have any sort of thoughts on that, Martin? Like how to how to to find a way through the complexity by maybe drawing on some of what Guinness have done? Like the, you know, the technicalities of IFRS is not really something that I'm overly interested in because I'm not obviously practicing the, the financial reporting. And even when I was in practice, it was more internal costing. But I think we're, as we get more towards integrated reporting, uh, it's to me, it's, I'd love to see something, you know, mm-hmm. here's the one pager that tells us everything about the company. Key facts. And like, let's be honest, most annual yeah. reports do yeah. put something like that in there. But they're not statutory things. and mm. uh, Maybe they should be. Uh, but I, I, I really don't know what they could be, but I just get lost on that. Yeah. So I just want to look yeah, at the balance sheet. No. Profit and loss, and no, no more. And yeah. I, I'm even still calling it. <laughs> you can say, yeah. <laughs> profit and loss and comprehensive income. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, um, <laughs> but like, you made an important point there is um, I think the staple of any, any half decent management accountant is that ability to condense all those numbers into a one pager and get that message across. I think that that's key for our, our audience listening in is, can you reduce that down to one page? And, and, and... Well, like I'll give you a, an example from practice, two things from practice, which kind of gave me some education in terms of re- realizing what's important to managers. I was asked at some point to produce a report which was shown profitability by customer for our top 50 customers or something like that. These things happen quite often. You get asked to do ad hoc reports. Then they become part of the monthly reporting pack. And the monthly reporting pack gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you start to think, is anyone actually looking at this? And then you can deliberately leave them out and see what happens. <laughs> Trust me, I've done this. And three, four months later, nobody's noticed that things have gone missing. So then you start to realize what's relevant and what's not. And another thing was the general manager, I think, or maybe the operations manager the company once said, I don't care about statistics. I just want to know what a factory sounds like when I come mm. in each day. And he knew by the sound of the factory wow. what it was making. And yeah. he, he had an instinct. Okay, it's making double wall, double wall cardboard. Okay, that's slow. That's not very profitable. What we've got to be doing this afternoon, you know? Mm. So like sometimes even as management accountants, we do produce reports, but sometimes instinct is, is, is what's really important to, to, to managers. And yes, we can help that by giving them the right kind of numbers and the right statistics. But I think it's it's not it's not always possible to, to condense something down to one measure. But if we could, that would be the ideal world for the management accountant. But the process, I think the value though, like maybe one measure is a bit of a challenge, but but the process of getting down to it and distilling it to its key essence is essentially for that, that manager, it was the sound, you know, and, and it's what works for the audience, right? So, I mean, that's a really, really good point. Martin so um, look dude, I was just thinking you've been giving us great great advice Martin I was just curious what, what's been the best bit of advice you've ever received whoa <laughs> that's a good question best bit of advice I've ever received it was probably about trust from a manager mm-hmm. um, I moved into an IT a business analyst type role well, as I mentioned earlier as part of an SAP implementation team and that brought me much closer to, to um, the factory floor to understanding the processes within the factory because as a manager and accountant, yes, you understood, but you weren't actually understanding the processes as in as much detail as you might need to for a business ana- analysis type role. It was, you know, something along the lines of, I know you're good at your accounting, but you need to build up trust with me. And when you do that, I'll do anything for you. Mm. And it was kind of a lesson about I need to build up respect and trust of him and the people under him. And when we do that, we get things done. And, you know, that was probably mid to late 20s and it was probably the best piece of advice i can i could remember yeah yeah it sticks in my mind yeah and, and look um on that journey as you're sort of building up that trust like what sort of things were you doing that 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 some of our could probably follow in your steps or try out anyway we this was prior to the year 2000 and we were doing we had to change our systems not necessarily because they weren't compliant for 2000, but the person who wrote the programming code behind the systems, uh, just those systems ran the factory, they ran sales, they ran invoicing, mm. um, had passed away. Oh. So like he wasn't available to maintain them. So it was quite an old system from the 1980s. And we had to upgrade. So we're getting a packaged piece of software for the uh, paper industry. You know, it meant I had to go out to the factory floor sometimes to work with people. I was in shipping, mm. you have to work with people to try to figure out the processes, to try to figure out how we can do things, to set up the standard costs in the system. Because I didn't know 
to give you an example, what boxes on what machine ran slower? But the operators on the machines did. And then here's this fella coming out with a sort of, you know, his, his suit and tie, the accountant lad. We don't like him automatically. You yeah. know? <laughs> He's looking at our jobs. He's going to cut jobs. You know, the reality, obviously, we obviously weren't. But it does take quite a bit of time to build up that trust. But I think the only way you can build up trust is interaction with people and try to understand what it is they do yeah. and try to view them as a source of information and sometimes very valuable information. Mm. Yeah. Um, and to give you an example, 40 foot container or 40 foot trailer with boxes in the back. OK, the boxes are on a pallet and the customer would specify how many boxes per pallet. And one of the guys in shipping on the fork trucks once said, why don't we ask the customer to reduce the number of boxes on each pallet? Then we could stack one pallet on top of the other and fit twice as much in the truck. And for your listeners that don't know where Donegal is, Dublin's in the middle of Ireland and Donegal's up the far end north. Okay, It's the furthest point away from Dublin mm -hmm. in terms of a haulage company. The haulage companies work on a radius from the location, basically, usually from Dublin, the capital. And they charge more the further they go. So if you are getting twice the amount of product on a truck for 500 euro, your costs were halved. Mm. Mm. That piece of knowledge came from a truck truck driver. And you're looking, why didn't we think of that before now? Mm -hmm. And if you build up trust and relationships with people, they will always, in my experience, help you. We should be able to do that as accountants. We have um, in, information, you know. And, and to give you another example, to, to interact teaching and, and practical work. So maybe I was always a bit of a teacher. I don't know. <laughs> like when SAP came our way in Ireland, probably 2000 and two maybe and mm. um, we Ireland and the UK were the first outside of the US to get SAP obviously because of the English language and then they moved on to other countries like France and Spain Italy and so on you had to educate guys in the store who were taking in the raw materials which for us was a big heavy roll of paper about two ton guys when you enter that it hits the profit and loss account immediately now first of all you have to explain what a profit and loss account is <laughs> yeah. to an non-accountant yeah. Or, or an income statement, yeah. whatever you like to call it, and say, like, if you make a mess of this, guys, the profit of the company is affected. There wouldn't be maybe 3,000 rolls of paper a year coming into the place. But if you multiply that by the number of operations all around the world, you know, there's a big effect there on the profit and loss that things are done wrong. Yeah. It was a great experience to be able to educate them. They had the screen, for example, to work off, but I would have shown them, listen, this is what happens to your figure thereafter. Mm -hmm. And if you make a mess of this, you know, each roll is worth a couple of grand. So every time you make a mistake, you know, you're, you're hitting the thing by, by a couple of grand. So it's, I think it, it's great to be able to, to, as an accountant, kind of build up that trust and experience. And like, let's face it, as an accountant, as a management accountant, it's good to know these things too. It's, it's not really all that interesting sitting in an office with a computer <laughs> exactly. screen and a spreadsheet, you know? Yeah. You need to, to get out there on the factory floor sometimes, or, or if you're a service company, actually go and deliver the service with people. Yeah. And you will see how things work and you may see how to, to do things better. Yeah, that, uh, some 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 great bits of advice in there, Martin. I can I can see why you're. Yeah, I think that teach is probably more natural to you than you're giving yourself credit for. <laughs> I was going to sort of suggest, uh, ask actually if um, you know. Obviously, I'm going to recommend our audience go check out that article you wrote, and I'll put a link into the show notes. But would there be any sort of handful of resources you recommend your audience go follow up on or things to do? Like I suppose. Personally, I find uh, resources on the internet absolutely wonderful in terms of Excel and things like that. Like, if you want, to, I don't have any specifically to mind, mm -hmm. but if you want to know more about integrated reporting, go and look at the integrated yeah. reporting framework. Yeah. It's cool. Um, you have the what's the organization called about the balance scorecard? I cannot remember off the top of my head. Um, It'll come back to me. And then you, there are plenty of resources, and I'm not just plugging SEMA here, but there are some good resources on the CGMA yeah. and SEMA websites. But quite often, I think the best resources are within your own organization. You just need to talk to the right people. I, you, I think you hit the nail on the head there as well, particularly with the last one. Martin, like, you know, I don't think we talk enough uh, with each other. And that's one of the reasons for this show is, is just to share what folks are doing or have been doing in our profession. And some of it might work for others or give people the ideas on, on what they can do in their own environments. So um, 
So yeah, we're not saying it's always going to work, but it might it work. It might work, but like I, I think you know, going back to what we were we were chatting about earlier, you know, resources. But as an accountant, you've got a lot of resources. You've got, you know, not only your your the finance and stuff, but your training. If you think about your training, even think back before your training. We we were we were chatting offline about this before before we started. You know, people forget the basic skills that we learn in school. Like I've got a daughter, and I've seen her doing mathematics at that third level, third year in secondary school. So God forget that stuff but there are certain things you don't forget just to give you a little anecdote related to to assist the same systems change for y2k you know the, our, our factory had well but two thousand two and a half thousand separate products all captured within an old system there was no way to automatically interface from the old to the new so that meant we had to manually input information about our products and the products were cardboard boxes so you've got lots of dimensions widths uh, lengths heights all numeric we had colors of inks that would be printed on the boxes they were all numeric we had um, a cutting die uh, you'd have cutting dies with something which would cut the shape of the box or cut a hand hole in the box and those had numeric numbers attached to them so everything was basically numbers and uh, i can recall the it guy at the time come and saying uh, to me you know how do we check that we've done everything right? Because what we did was we split that two and a half thousand products over everybody in the office, everybody, everybody that could type got maybe 50 or 60 or hundred or whatever to get the things done. And he said to me, how do you, how do you check that we've done things right? How do you check that, you know, people keying stuff in haven't done the classic transposition errors or, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And I th- I'm looking at him like, I, I don't know. He said, you done maths in school, didn't you? And I said, yeah, well, one minus the other, if they're the same, the answer is zero. And you go, oh, God, yeah. You know, such basic skills that you have yeah. learned that sometimes you just need to be reminded of to to apply. And I think those basic skills yeah. are, to me, I'm slightly, I'm not old, but I'm getting slightly older, are, are even more important than they were 20 years ago because so much is automated. But to me, yeah. while I really love technology, it does exactly what it says on the tin. So if the formula is wrong or the program's wrong, you're going to get wrong numbers out. And you have to have this intuition to go, no, seven times seven is 49, not 69. I think the core skills that we learn even before we become accountants are also relevant to us. They're another resource we can draw on. Even our ability to write and speak English or whatever your language is. I like that, Martin. It doesn't always have to be. I mean, the numbers are really important, but there's also the language mm-hmm. element as well. Absolutely. And I think I think yeah, yeah that's uh, that's a really good point. Um, it, you know, I suppose if if some of our audience wish to continue the conversation, uh, where's the best place to connect with you at? Um, you'll get me on. You'll see my details on on Queen's University's website. You can probably contact me through there, or I do have a blog, martinjquinn.com, which. I try to update once or twice a month and give some practical examples about, that I see in real life. And the latest one was about opportunity costs, which I oh. just a tiny, you know, I'm involved in a voluntary committee trying to bring a German style Christmas market to my local town. And I'm treasurer, naturally. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, the chairman said, we've got to pay the county council, you know, the local regional authority for uh, parking spaces. And I'm there, what? Well, because because we're blocking off the street um, for three days at the weekend, well, parking's only valid two of those days, but they, they're looking and say, okay, 150 per hour for between 9 a.m. and 6, so we're losing that money. So that's an opportunity cost to them. He, The chairman was saying, why are they doing that? And then I had to turn around and explain to him what an opportunity cost is. So I just relate, related that little story on on, um, on the blog. So little things like that appear on the blog from time to time. So no, look, and again, I, I'm going to put those links into the show notes as well, Martin. Um, look, you, you've covered uh, some really great areas. Uh, that sort of uh, fascinating insights from Guinness. Your your experiences as a as a pracademic, <laughs> uh, practical and academic. I love that. That's your word. I mean, I, I didn't come up with that. That's your word. Um, but um, but before we sort of let you go and, and and enjoy the rest of your Friday, is there sort of any other uh, parting thoughts you'd wish to leave with our audience? I think the, you, you just touched on it, and it, it's what I'm going to say is based on personal experience. The ability to communicate is more than the ability to talk. I think 
accountants, yes, we can be good verbal communicators and, and so most professionals generally are. But I think gradually over time, we, we, we've, we all, society has, has decreased its ability to write uh, because we don't seem to need to write as much. But I can just recall one example. The local property tax was introduced in Ireland in 2013 and the letter revenue said you know, nobody could understand. So written communication to me is really, really important. And I think that can also mean multiple languages. Trust me, I've seen positions available in my company in the past where if you spoke a language, the right language, knew the industry and knew SAP, you could just name your price. You know, we have become more homogenized as a, as, as a society, globally, but I think it's really important the ability to communicate verbally and written. So that, that, that would be my finishing thought. And other, this wasn't well, another finishing thought. I don't believe any numbers accountants give you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, joking, I'm joking on that one. <laughs> no, but, oh, what a great yeah, to, no, to, 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 be, to be uh, more realistic. Question. Yeah, yeah. Everything. Yeah. Question everything. Yeah, I think that's a great way to 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 wrap up the show. So, Martin, really appreciate you coming on today and investing. No problem, Andrew. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. And when all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care and let's keep building our strength in the numbers. 